Welcome to the Research Planning Process Series. This is Dr. Amanda rockinson Zapku, and in this session we're going to focus on the theoretical framework. We have two goals in this session. First, we're going to define the theoretical framework, and second, we're going to understand the role that the theoretical framework plays in the research process. The theoretical framework is really a collection of interrelated concepts or a theory in which you ground your research. A theoretical framework guides your research, determining what you'll measure, the relationships that you're looking for, even, it even determines what um, units of interest you're in, your constructs, your variables, how you understand the relationship between those variables, and also the boundaries of interaction. It creates boundaries for your research. Maxwell and Tuesday 2005 said that a theoretical framework really serves two purposes, and I have them listed on this slide. He first says that it's to show how your, re uh, your research fits into what is already known. Again, like I said, um, the relationship to the existing theory or, or research. And it's also to show how your research makes a contribution to the topic in the field. Uh, um, let's think about it in terms of human beings, a theoretical framework. Um, think for a moment, what is your belief about the nature of human beings? Do you believe that they're mainly good? Do you believe that they're lazy? Do you believe that they're basically untrustworthy? Everyone has a belief about the basic nature of human beings. And that belief really guides how you interact with other people. It guides um, how you think about other people. And the same thing about a theoretical framework. A theoretical framework really guides your study. It helps you organize all of your ideas. A theoretical study really guides your literature review. It guides your research. It informs your questions as well as your methodology. A theory in a qualitative study is used inductively. In a quantitative study, it's used deductively. In a quantitative study, as a researcher, um, the theory the theory really should ground your plan for your research. The objective is for you to test or verify your theory. Um, you thus usually begin the study with advancing the theory. That's, that's what you, ha you have in mind. You want to advance the theoretical framework. You want to advance the theory. You collect data to test it, and then you reflect on the results that you have and decide, does, do your results confirm or do they disconfirm the theory. The theory really becomes the framework. Like I'm saying, it becomes the framework for the entire study. If you think about it as an organizing model for your research questions, for your hypotheses, and really your entire data collection. Uh, Maxwell says that really a theoretical framework um, helps you answer two questions. What's the problem and why is your approach feasible? Now, we've talked about a theoretical framework conceptually. We, Dr. Zeidler, in her paper, What is a Theoretical Framework? A Practical Answer, provides a hypothetical situation in which really demonstrates how a theoretical framework guides research and the research question specifically. So let's take a look at that, that hypothetical situation she provides us with um, and gain some insight about a theoretical framework. A student, let's say a doctoral student, becomes really intrigued by the importance of questioning in a secondary classroom. Let's say she's a secondary teacher, and she's noticed that some of her students really, really benefit from higher level thinking questions, whereas some of the others just don't, and she's wondering why that is. Well, since she's a doctoral student, she's thinking about using this for a dissertation, she needs to empirically ground the question, find out if it's if her question's even empirically significant. Maybe she can go to the literature and actually find the answers. So she begins researching questioning, questioning strategies, the effectiveness of questioning strategies. And what she finds out is, is that the results in the literature are really contradictory. So there are some studies that say that higher cognitive level questions lead to more achievement. But then there's probably about an equal number of study that says that there's no difference in the type of question, whether it's low or high level questioning. And there's also some that say higher level questioning is worse. So at this point, what does she do? She 
begins reflecting on what she's found, speculating about some possible explanations for the contradictory literature. As she's doing this, she remembers Piaget. Piaget said that students are at different cognitive levels at different ages. Therefore, she starts thinking about questioning in terms of what Piaget says, that there are different cognitive levels at different ages. She then goes back to the literature and begins, begins meticulously searching the literature on questioning in relationship to cognitive development and starts pulling some of the theory on cognitive development. In doing this, she comes up with a possible explanation. Could it be that students at different cognitive levels, because that's what cognitive theory says, different cognitive levels actually process and are affected by questionings at different levels differently? Let me say that again. Could it possibly be that students um, at different cognitive levels are affected differently by questions of different cognitive levels? So her theory helps her understand why there could potentially be contradictory literature. No one to this point has actually looked at the match between the, the level of questioning and the cognitive level of the child. And maybe if, she, if some of the studies looked at lower level, um, cogn or lower level students or students that were younger and used higher level questioning, it wasn't appropriate and therefore it wasn't effective. Whereas if the studies looked at children, let's say, 10 to 14 in middle school or high school, um, and they the students were highly cognitive functioning, then high cognitive level questions positively affected them. So the theory helps her frame and understand the problem as well as what's occurring in the literature. Now, the theoretical framework informs her research questions, her methodology, as well as her hypotheses. And here are the hypotheses she then comes up with. Both high and low cognitive level students will benefit from both high and low level questions as opposed to no questions at all. And then, only students categorized as high cognitive level will benefit more from the high cognitive level questions than from the low level questions. The hypothetical situation that we just looked at really helps us better understand a theoretical framework. As you can see, a theoretical framework is like a spotlight. It's useful in illuminating what we see. It really highlights the relationship between what's been identified and what hasn't. Um, and we really saw how Piaget's theory illuminated what was going on in the literature in terms of questioning. A theoretical framework, and we didn't discuss this as in depth, a theoretical framework is also like a coat closet. It's where you hang everything. Um, and this really becomes important when you explain your results and understand the results. So for example, in our hypothetical situation, this doctoral student, um, once she receives her results, maybe she finds that if you match the question to the level of thinking that a student's at, the question is effective. And that can be clearly explained by people Piaget's work. I really think that examples are helpful in understanding complex concepts such as theoretical framework. So let's take a look at one other study um, and further understand the theoretical framework and as well as understand the difference between what I call the big T and the little t. And big T is theory and little t is theoretical. A few years ago I wanted to study the effectiveness of distance education for adults. Now, my first challenge was to define effectiveness. What we know about adult learners is that traditional behavioral methods of teaching do not necessarily work. That um, strategies grounded in social constructivism and um, constructivism is really more effective. So I knew that my big T when I'm defining theoretical frame or when I'm defining lear effective learning, my big T really needed to be something such as Vygotsky from Vygotsky or Dewey or Piaget, something grounded in uh, social constructivism. That's my big T. However, 
those theories don't necessarily strictly apply to adult learners in distance education. So I started a search for a theoretical framework that was grounded in these bigger T's. What I came across was, and what I came across in the literature, is that there were really two things that are important for effective education, and that's community as well as um, critical thinking or um, higher order learning. So through my literature review, what I found was, was a theoretical framework called the Community of Inquiry Framework. And what that framework says is that there are three things that are necessary, three factors that are necessary for effective education to occur. And that's social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. That so those three elements must be present in a higher education online classroom in order for effective in order for it to be effective so I found so that became the theoretical framework my understanding for what how I defined effectiveness in my study now here's something else I wanted to under, I said I wanted to understand the effectiveness of online learning and distance education and so I, I use that theoretical framework to define that however what I was really interested in and this was based on experience was the, is the use of, does the use of synchronous technologies in the classroom make online learning more effective? Let me take a moment and define synchronous and asynchronous. And specifically what I was thinking of using in my study. When I say synchronous, what I mean is real-time interaction through a computer or some type of mobile device such as video conferencing and I specifically wanted to look at video conferencing in which people all got online um, and videoed themselves and interacted in real time. I wanted to compare that type of interaction and communication in the classroom with asynchronous communication and that's when people interact um, at, at um, delayed times or not in real time. For example, discussion forums. Someone posts a question or a comment, and somebody comes by two or three hours later, reads it, reflects on it, and posts a comment or a question back. And I wanted to know what would be more effective for communicating among learners. Now, I had to, I had to, why would I even study that? I had to consider why, why was that even important to study? Do I have any theoretical justification for studying it? Now, in education, there really wasn't any, any theory that would justify it. However, if I moved to communication theory, I found that there were several theories that had been, theories and theoretical frameworks that had been developed that said that the more natural communication on the computer is, the more face-to-face -face like it is, the more effective the communication is. So the more real life like we get with communication over the internet, the better two people interacting understand each other, um, the better they're able to understand complex concepts. So I took those theories and said, okay, can we now, let's test them and can, do they now apply to education? And taking that media naturalness theory, what I, what I, what that, if I tested in the education realm, what I would hope to see if it holds true is that synchronous communication, because it's more lifelike, actually increases the effectiveness of um, of learning or eff the effectiveness of the distance education classroom. So my question then became, is there a difference in student social presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence based on the type of technology that's used in the classroom for communication? Now again, the effectiveness, the community of inquiry framework helped me define what effectiveness was in my study. It was the lenses that I looked through to understand effectiveness. And what I was really doing in my study was testing the media naturalness theory and to see if it held true in, the, in education. So as you can see again, the theoretical framework really helps, helped me or helps anyone understand the variables and constructs that are being studied, the relationship between them, as well as the, it provides a boundary for exactly what is being studied and really guides the research question.
let's talk about your work and your research. You've come up with an idea. Now you need to work on how you understand that phenomenon, that idea that you're going to study, and how you and you need to come up with a theoretical justification for it. The theoretical justification may be a big T or it may be a little T. When you actually go to discuss it in your manuscript, you need to talk about your primary theory or theoretical framework. If your primary theoretical framework is a little t, you need to talk about the big T in which it's grounded in. You then need, I talk about theoretical justification, so you talk about your theory. You then talk about how your theory helps inform your research. You discuss how you hope to advance that theory. In the example that I gave of media naturalness theory, what, what I'd seen in the literature was that the media naturalness theory, which is actually based in media richness, um, that theory held true in the communication field, and I was testing to see if it held true in the education field. So you you discuss your theory, you give a general description of it, you discuss if it's been refined over time, and if it's gone from a big T to a little T. You discuss how the theory has. Um, advanced or informed the literature on your topic. You talked about you talk about um, how it informs your research. And then finally you're going to conclude by articulating how your focus relates to or potentially advances the identified theories. Um, so just ex describing and explaining how the theory informs your research and then how you hope to advance the research. So this concludes our session on theoretical framework. I hope you have a better understanding of a theoretical framework as well as are now able to define